On the morning of 7th of July, Miriam was on her way to um, a meeting at Canary Wharf. And someone had just mentioned casually, oh, there's been some bombs in London. And we didn't think anything of it, to be perfectly honest. And we went out shopping and we came back. Before we went, we did try and contact Philip. She must have just decided to jump on the first bus that would hopefully get her closer to her meeting. That's when I think we knew, you know, something serious has happened to her because it's, she would, Fiona would never not turn up to work. From that precise moment, I knew that he was dead. I don't think they're 100% certain, but it looks likely that she was actually sitting directly in front of Hasib Hussein. Graham Russell's son Philip was on his way to work on 7th of July 2005 when he was killed on the number 30 bus. Esther Hyman's sister Miriam was on the top deck of the bus. She died almost immediately. Andrea Watson's sister Fiona Stevenson was killed in the Aldgate tube bombing on her way to work. David Gardner was on the Circle Line train at Edgware Road. He survived. Pop! which sounded like a balloon bursting, as I always say. Someone described the detonator's noise, and I thought that was obviously what, what I heard, the pop, and then the rushing of wind and, and sort of kinetic of things flying through black and white, you know, everything, just, 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 absolutely extraordinary. All I know is that I did, I felt that I was flying through the air. I, 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 I was obviously saved by people who were standing and by the fact that I was next to this glass or plastic, whatever, was partition. I was always conscious, but I didn't, as it were, see anything. And, and I still find it hard to, to visualize what it was. Obviously, it was so extraordinary. But I do, I know that I finally sort of landed flat, well, on the ground at sort of right angles in front of where I was sitting. My very focused glasses had certainly shot off and they'd gone. Um, my ears must have been punctured obviously immediately and I felt my body all over to see if I was alive basically I suppose and um, and I sort of felt that like I was all there until I my hand ventured to my left side and I just felt this muddy mushy awfulness on my leg and thinking uh-uh I think you know I'm not going to move from you anyway. The following day um my daughter's husband and a friend of his went up to London by bike actually, cycled around all the hospitals to try and find Philip. They just found it so hard trying to find any information of what had gone on, who to contact, who was organising. I had seen Yvonne Nash making an appeal about her fiancé Jamie Gordon on, on breakfast television. And I decided also to get in touch with them at that point. How do you go around trying to look for someone that you don't know where they would be or how they're going to be there and, and what state you're going to find that person in? And on the Friday, um, we were contacted by the local police um, because by then they knew that Philip was one of those that were missing and they, the, the Chief Constable of Kent appointed a family liaison officer, which was long before the Metropolitan Police got round to doing it for the rest of the the victims. It became a roller coaster really of appeals to, to, to find her. The rest of the days are just a blur really, a blur of filling out forms for the police in terms of trying to ID her, um, you know, giving DNA, um, trying to locate all of her steps. I guess at some point over that following weekend it did start to dawn that it could be possible that she'd been on the bus. I couldn't believe that that was the case myself. I just kept on clinging to that idea that she, you know, she was alive somewhere but just totally didn't know who she was and she'd gone on a train somewhere and you know she'd sort of figure it out in a minute and let us know. So we waited until the Monday when our family liaison officer came here and uh, explained to my parents that Mim had been identified by her dental records. So we waited four days. And I can tell you that that was by far the worst period. Six o'clock on Monday evening, which was his birthday, would have been his birthday on that Monday. 
and he, we had a knock on the door from the family liaison officer to say that, um, yes, Philip was dead and he'd been formally identified and so on. The following Friday, um, we finally got a call from the police saying that they'd had news and then they came to the house and told us that she was dead, so that was sort of how we found out. I think it was just the waiting of a week and just not knowing, not knowing what had happened and every nightmare goes through your head, every vision of where could she be and, you know, how injured could she be and was she in any pain, you know, all those kind of questions because you just want answers to in terms of knowing what actually happened. There was a great tearing of shirts and I know I tried to help Peter and I think I made some sort of crack about it. it's not quite like the movies. <laughs> because, <you know. laughs> because it took probably, and this is what the inquest sort of bring up, about 45 to an hour before proper sort of help came our way. In that time, extraordinarily, everyone, I, the way I felt it, you know, something bad had happened and people just came out of their shells. <laughs> and so those sort of indifferent people we suddenly, you know, wanting to help everyone, trying to do everything for people. They were so, so, so they were terrific. I've always felt that, that that it was a bit of a farce the way they identified Philip, because from what we found out since, he was hanging out of the bus basically. He had all identification documents on him, and they could have told us that he was dead by the Thursday night, Friday morning at the very latest. And they didn't. It's that sort of thing that really hurts, that really it makes you think, well, you could have told us, you didn't have to leave it till it was his birthday. And I think a lot of families felt the same way, that it took them too long to identify the victims. I was finally put on the, this wonderful sort of makeshift stretcher or whatever by these guys and, and taken out and then up the steps at Edgeware Road and then into the light. I always remember seeing the light and then pushed in the back of an ambulance. I remember saying to this guy, I quite like my leg, you know, can I keep it or something? And he probably to save me from any further shock that I might be having or, or will have, um, said 50-50 or words to that effect of we'll see what we can do or something. And then it was into the operating theatre and um, they said it was about a five and a half hour operation where they, that's where they amputated the leg. That's where they took out my spleen. But I think one of the f feelings I had really while I was in the hospital was knowing that someone would say, like, oh dear, you know, what's, what's going to happen to the rest of your life sort of thing. Well, it's, safe, it's not the end, you know. And um, I had this sort of feeling that anyone who came in to see me, they would leave happier than they came in. Everyone sort of reacted differently to that day. Everyone sort of got over it in different ways. I think just because I, I saw so much love that came out of that and, and, and didn't dwell or, or didn't really see you know, the hate that provoked it. So many people seem to be affected by you know, what happened. So you, you wanted to sort of show that the affection was sort of, or was, was well placed as so the, the other affection. I think the whole inquest has been handled extremely well. I think that the coroner, uh, Lady Justice Hallett, has done an extremely good job. I think she's been very sympathetic, very empathetic with all of the bereaved families. It's been brilliant for us because we found out a lot of the questions that we wanted to know. Um, the first one was, you know, did she, was she conscious? Was she unconscious? How long did she live for? And, you know, we found out that she was alive for half an hour, but she wasn't conscious. And I suppose listen to the other survivors talking, um, people seem to say, you know, it'd be like a light going off. That was, um, something that we really wanted to hear because some of the other people weren't as lucky as that. She was thrown from the bus onto the pavement directly outside the entrance of the BMA building. In the office directly next to the entrance worked a gentleman called Clive Featherston and he's an IT technician there so not a medic but within a minute of the explosion he had come out of the BMA and he was kneeling by my sister and holding her hand and reassuring her. We had found out about Clive over a period of a few years after 7-7 um, 
but what we didn't know until the inquest was that after Clive was told to leave my sister by an officer, another passerby called Richard Collins came and attended her as well. I don't see it as that she died because someone couldn't prevent it. In my head, she died because four people woke up one day and decided they were going to go and bomb London. Um, that was their individual action. It was within their control what they decided to do and what they didn't. Um, the, you know, MI5 and preventing it is very difficult to say, and I think they said it at the inquest as well. It's very hard to know how far do you go that you can prevent something. But in terms of could they have stopped her murder, it's one of those that you're never going to answer. Um, I don't think anyone sat there and let it happen. I would not blame anybody for the 7-7. Um, I don't think it's, it's anybody's fault that it happened. However, I think money played a big part in the amount of uh, people that the intelligence services had and the way they were able to work simply because they had to prioritise. They still had to prioritise. I think that the emergency services could have been better prepared. I hope that lessons will be learnt from, um, will be taken away from um, the inquest um, and applied if such a thing should happen again in the future. Um, it did seem to us that our pain was prolonged unnecessarily. But of course, rationally, I can understand that, that, that there was a state of great confusion. There were obviously, as we've discovered, lots of faults in the various services, but my God, they also did wonderful things for us as well. There were a few of us who were close to death probably, but we've survived and we've gone up and some people unfortunately, probably right next to me, probably saved my life because they took it, um, probably with similar injuries, didn't survive or whatever. And, um, and it must be terrible for their families because you know, they would never you know, see what I've seen. But, but I think, I always hope that because of what I saw that day, and I think what the inquest has brought out is that that love that was shown to us who were trying to survive was also shown to those who didn't. I don't think it would benefit anybody anymore to keep raking over what happened and what didn't happen on the 7th of July 2005. I think now we have to close the issue. Um, the whole issue will never be closed for everybody that was involved, for all the families, for all of those that survived, and for all those that, that helped all the emergency services. I mean, a lot of those people were severely affected by what they saw. Um, that will never change. You can't do anything about that. You just have to live with it. But I think the public's examination is, is finalised. We've sort of spent a lot of time waiting for things and I think this is quite difficult because it is bringing the end in sight in terms of information. Um, I don't know what happens after this, but from our viewpoint, we're not then waiting for anything else. So whether that brings its own feelings and is more difficult in other ways, because there's that final chapter. I hate the word closure, but there is that kind of thing. In terms of our feelings, I don't think our feelings change. We still miss her so much. You still, you know, grieve for the loss of life. But yeah, so hopefully the waiting will, will finish after this. In the years since the bombings, a number of the bereaved families have set up charitable projects to remember their loved ones. We um, put the compensation money that we were awarded together with funds that we raised. And in 2008, we went into partnership with the Alvi Prasad Eye Institute in India um, and opened the Miriam Hyman Children's Eye Care Centre. We provided the equipment for the centre. And at that point, we um, committed to supporting them in the long term. We wanted to give the money back to somewhere in Belize because that was where she, you know, she really sort of found herself in that corny way and we remember her talking about the amount of child drownings that would happen and um, how she loved the diving so we wanted to do again something water and then that developed into um, doing swimming lessons for underprivileged children. 
we set it up as a Fiona Stevenson Memorial Fund. It's been going since 2006, so we've done a lot with it. And this year we'll be pivoting um, about 200 children through and we'll be training about 100 lifeguards as well because we wanted people to not only learn how to swim but kind of link it into employability. Um, so if they can use that, because there's a lot of tourism in terms of diving, if they could use that to then get a job, whether it's a lifeguard or, or going into something within diving, then again it, it kind of feeds into the community.